Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, timeless investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding Podcast, the number one value investing podcast in the world, sitting next to the Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. Hey, if this is the first time that you are checking in with us, if you're watching us on YouTube, we're trying to hack that YouTube algorithm. Leave us a comment, hit that thumbs up button, trying to spread the word. If you are listening to us on the podcast side of things, as you know, a um, rating and review goes a very long way for us as well. Hopefully five stars. We're pumping out a ton of content, 165 plus uh, different podcasts, three a week. Uh, we're coming up on our two-year anniversary. I actually listened to our first podcast the other day. It was like oh, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. Couldn't fall asleep. Okay. I was just thinking about stuff. And I'm like, let's listen to the first podcast. I turn it off literally within like two minutes. Okay. Literally two minutes. I, it was just like nails on chalkboard for me. So we have gotten better. And by we, I mean me. Yeah, and everyone can go back and listen from it, the beginning. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. If you're going to judge us and leave us a rating, do it on um, on uh, the more recent podcasts. If this is the first time that you are also checking with us, again, uh, go to focuscompounding.com. Join our mailing list, the famous Gannon Gazette. That is free. You get a free idea from the website on the premium side of things every couple of weeks when we send the email out. And then of course, if you want to subscribe to uh, the website or become a member of the website, you want to interact with us and talk about stocks, I use the podcast promo code, which is podcast, and I'll take some money off of the price every single month. And then we also do have an annual membership as well, which is discounted. Uh, so in today's podcast, we're going to be just going over 10K, okay. right? We're now that we're, um, you know, just these incredible content creators and recording our screen now, okay. which we haven't done in the past. I don't know why, because it seems so obvious, right? Talking about especially finance stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked through a 10K in the past, uh, but we've really talked out loud about it. So I said, why not record the screen and actually just go through a 10K and kind of see where we end up? Right. I don't know how long this will be. We have zero agenda for it. If it takes 10 hours, I'm sorry. If it takes 30 minutes, and then we did a good job. Okay. Um, so we're going to use GameStop. Right. This is a stock that's been sort of in the news lately, right? Um, it's been written up on the website a few times, and I usually see it on uh, Twitter as well. Uh, ticker GME. I guess before we dig into it, why don't we just go through the QuickFS? We are using QuickFS.net. Mm -hmm. Shout out to them. They don't pay us to say that, but we definitely love the product. Um, I'm sure everybody knows what uh, GameStop is, and uh, Wow, I don't even know how to where to start. Valuation ratio. <laughs> it's incredibly cheap. <laughs> incredibly cheap. EV to sales when we use that is 0.1. Right. 10 year median margins on EBIT, 6.2. 10 year median margins Nothing's on gross profit. EV to free cash flow. I yeah. mean, these are the cheapest that you. However, it's been that way for a few years. It has been that yeah. way. So yes. a few times free cash flow, a few times EBIT, things like that is incredibly, incredibly cheap. Uh -huh. um, the EV calculation is a little complicated because they have leases and stuff, so I, I wouldn't exactly buy that. But still, on a market cap basis, there's no doubt the stock's incredibly cheap. Whether people buy it or not because they think it's going to zero or not is the question. Clearly, it is not because they think it's too expensive mm -hmm. but otherwise a solid company yes yeah okay so let's go to their 10k so what's the first thing that you look for right, right when you so open up you a 10k know how to print out the 10k yep. and then mark up some things so let's go over the things that i would literally mark up yep. so i would do, circle their uh location yep. right there including the city that they're in so they're in grievine which happens to be very close to us uh i would circle their uh, state of incorporation which is delaware and put a check mark next to the delaware because i understand you know the that's the state where I would understand the rules the best uh, mm -hmm. because probably half the companies I look at are incorporating Delaware. Um, and then I would also look at the fact that they have one class of common stock and that they're on the New York Stock Exchange. So I would circle that too. Uh -huh. uh, I also would select, I would um, circle at the very top the date of it. So this is for the fiscal year ended February 2nd, 2019. I would do that. And then as you've highlighted there, I would do the number of shares down at the bottom. Yep. And I always do that. And then I also would just write that down my own way, um, which is in this case, what I'd say 102 million. Have you ever called this number right here? No. Should we call and see who picks up? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, and then you have the, uh, so that's all I would do on the cover sheet. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, you know, table of contents goes over everything. Jeff, and we do read from, you know, a lot of people ask, do you read the whole thing? Yes. yes we read, so read the whole the thing. Safety disclosures and everything. Everything. There are companies that have mine safety disclosures. I wonder if people read 10 Ks wonder if like that ever is an item. Every company files something that includes mine safety disclosures. Very, very few companies mm -hmm. have anything written for that. But if you have a company like we are invested in that does mine stuff, there's uh, stuff in that section. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then item one, the business section. Yes. This so, is where you learn about the business. If you can't understand this part of the business, the way that they describe it, I would be uh, kind of concerned maybe, but try to figure out a little bit more yeah, about it. So let's read that first sentence. I mean, highlight it and read it because this is the kind of things you actually have to face in terms of understanding a business. If you had never been in a GameStop before, how just based on the 10K do you understand what they're saying? Mm -hmm. So let's start there. So they describe themselles as a global multi-channel video game and licensed consumer products retailer. So there's some problems with that right away mm -hmm. that I wonder about. What word would set, set, uh, kind of stick out to you? I would say probably be this word, right? One of them. Uh, retailer, yes. The ones that stuck out to me as odd are global and multi-channel. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> Licensed consumer products? Well, if you go in their stores now, you understand Like action figures and stuff like that. Funko stuff. Yeah. Like that. And it's a pretty big part of the business uh, in terms of the amount of space being given over to it and stuff. But the global multi-channel is weird because I obviously think of GameStop as being a U.S.-based um, retailer in physical stores. So they're saying two words there that are not that. They're mm -hmm. saying that we're global. Yeah. And they're saying multi-channel, which is a word that um, like brick and mortar companies use to describe being also selling stuff online. Well, you say four geographic segments, United States, Canada, Australia, and Europe. Yes. Hello. And so usually when they say that, that's the order, just so people know, usually. Mm -hmm. um, so that would generally mean if you have nothing else to go on, but they'll give us more to go on, um, that the U.S. is their biggest market, Canada is their second biggest, Australia their third biggest, and Europe their fourth biggest. That may not be the case. It's not the case. <laughs> it just goes the United States. Um, it looks like Europe, Australia, and then Canada, if that's what that means, which I'm sure that's what it means. No, that's the... What yeah, is? store count. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the store count. Okay. So they give the actual number of stores. Um, but it could be by revenue? No, I don't know what it is by um, because, you know, we'll see if the stores are, I don't know how the stores could be smaller in Europe. But yeah, that's a big number in Europe that they have, yeah. Um, so let's see what else it says. Uh, the reportable segments. So how do they break down their segments? They, uh, they have four geographic segments. So that means that somewhere in the 10K, they'll break down the geographic mm -hmm. segments. They have an incredible number of stores, which means the stores are obviously very small. Um, and then they also categorize things further by talking about different stuff. We're going to ignore the whole sections here that discuss a lot of the spring mobile stuff. I didn't know that they own Cricket things. Wireless. Yeah, in the past. so they own. Yeah, yeah. I remember That's seeing those in, those like pop ups in the mall and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah. that was a so obviously a diversification thing, and that was a concern. I mean, uh -huh. when I had looked at it before, to be honest, um, the fact they were diversifying into other stuff besides their core business is what made me kind of not want. To Simply be Mac. You ever been to one of those? No. Those are kind of cool. If you're like an Apple fanboy right. or girl. Uh -huh. Let's see. So they think that their market size says uh, for game products was approximately 18 billion in 2018. That's phys physical video game yes. products. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because obviously the video game market is much, much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how they define themselves. They then talk about the merchandise. Now, this is important because I think they're going to break down later for us the gross profit is my guess. But when they categorize the sale of their products and services as follows, that part where it says merchandise, this probably means they're going to give us margins on each of them. So if you've looked, this, the obvious one to compare this to is like a car dealer. So car dealers break down new sales used, you know, pre-owned, whatever they call these things, pre-owned, that's what they call it, uh, digital and then collectibles, which is like the Funko type stuff that I was talking about mm -hmm. too. Um, and so they'll have very different margins on them, probably with very poor margins on new. I mean, margins if they actually sell an Xbox or something are terrible. And then with um, with margins on like used games and stuff being a lot higher. Yeah. Did you used to use their uh, their trading like uh, I never it back did, in the day? No. no. I'm sure people still uh, do it, but I remember growing no, up, I, I did it all the time. I, I did shop at some of the stores that eventually became GameStop. Mm -hmm. So they talk about EB Games and things like that, which originally I think was EBX. Yeah, so here's the number of stores. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so above that they have it by state, so which is total, which is normally what you do with domestic. So just so people understand, for retailers, they normally break down the number uh, in each state, and you can... If you know the U.S. well, you can get a quick idea of whether those numbers make sense or whether they're unusual. Um, I would say GameStop seems like it's making a lot of sense. There's some that 
uh, no, they're all in line with what I expect. So like Texas and California. Wise. So yeah. Texas and California have huge numbers, but I mean, ones. you can just divide it into that. And like, for instance, so, you know, Alaska has six and Alaska is one of the smallest states. Uh, maybe Wyoming has, would have less. What's Wyoming's numbers stores here? Uh, it looks like eight. Eight. So you would see Alaska and Wyoming should have some of the least. Texas and uh, California and New York should have some of the most. Um, Florida should have a very high number, things like that. Um, so it's in line with what we would expect mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Let's see. They talk about the rewards program. They talk about Game Informer. These are the parts that I like to read a lot about. So this often gives you an idea of how the business really works when you read these kinds of sections because this is very voluntary stuff. They don't have to really put in a whole section about Power Up Rewards or Game Informer. Mm -hmm. So this is a thing that they mail out to um, all of their people that sign up. And basically, if you try to buy something from them, they're going to make you sign up. I mean, nicely, but they're not going to let you leave without giving your email address or your physical address or something. Mm -hmm. So they can send you this thing, which is sort of like a catalog type thing, you know, right? Do you usually do like revenue per per employee or just like a general thing like that? Things like that. Yeah. This one's going to be hard, of course, because they have a huge number of part-time employees. Uh Yeah. Yeah, 45,000. Mm-hmm. Part time, probably almost all be. How many? Do they it says between twenty three thousand and forty five thousand part right, time hourly employees. Time yeah. yeah, which makes a lot of sense. Uh-huh. And then so that also talks about the seasonality and things like that. Um, so and then we get to the risk. Yeah. What What do you typically look for in the risk factors? I I, I like so I enjoy reading every single one. I right. mean, some of these could be you know cut and cut and paste or copy and paste. But I mean, I think you really do kind of learn about the business through the risk factors. The interesting one here is number one, I would ignore that first one. Economic conditions in the U.S. and certain international markets could adversely affect demand for the products. Yeah, they could adversely affect demand for (laughs) any of those places. The one that's interesting is the video game industry has historically been cyclical in the introduction of next generation consoles. That's very interesting because it means that they're going to, one, the stock's probably going to respond to that. But two, um, that like the generation is going to affect their profitability and things with their sales like they're probably going to have high sales of new consoles when there's a new introduction and obviously the current generation of consoles is incredibly old they talk about how their 2013 was the introduction Mm -hmm. of uh, playstation 4 and xbox one that's very very uh old right Mm -hmm. so um that means that we're coming up on a you know new part of the cycle on at the end of one gaming cycle and the beginning of another one Mm -hmm. okay so they go through more yeah, so here's Risks. A, some of them is that they talk about collectibles. That's very interesting because that's only a word or two that they've said so far. We wouldn't necessarily have guessed that they have a lot to do with collectibles. Um, but they talk about their sales of collectibles and stuff. And um, it, that would be an interesting one to look at. They also have, this isn't that important, to be honest, but vendors I do look at normally. So it says our largest vendors at the next, um, on in that one, like the third to last line, it uh-huh. says, our largest vendors are Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, Take Two, etc. Um, and then it gives the percentages. So that's interesting. Uh, it's not interesting here because if you ask me who their largest vendors were, I would say Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, and actually, Take Two exceeds Activision Blizzard, I guess, right? Which is interesting, but not that interesting because if I remember right, GameStop doesn't sell any um, PC games. You own Activision. I own the stock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm the pass. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they go through more risk factors. Let's see. What do you think about this one? Changes to tariff and import slash export regulations may negatively impact our future financial condition and results of operations. I don't believe that's true. So <laughs> we'll see. I could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, it could with the collectibles thing, but I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't make a Funko collectible be $20 if the tariffs are huge. Sure. Okay. So, so we properties, go, this yep. is a very important section. So properties, uh, one, they don't have unresolved staff comments, but it is always interesting if you have unresolved staff comments. That means there's SEC stuff that you want to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, they give like comment letters and things. Um, so the properties thing, this is the big concern with GameStop, right? What's the very first line under properties? Um, all of our stores are leased. Yes, all of their stores. So they're yeah. leasing 5,830 locations. That's the scary part about GameStop. Um, so, and these are short leases, leases of one to five years mm-hmm. plus renewal options, things like that. So it talks about when they expire. Now they expire, this is very old. Um, I assume they'll be coming out with a new 10K very soon um, because we're at fiscal 2019 here. But so a huge number, in fact, I guess the majority of their leases from 2019 came up in 2019 and 2020, meaning in just two years it expired. So they could close a lot of stores quickly if they wanted to, obviously, because they lease them instead of owning mm-hmm. them. So it gives them a lot of flexibility that way. But on the other hand, it means that they have to cover their rent and that means their fixed charges are really high so that a, their margin of safety in terms of sales is a lot lower than if they owned all these things, right? Mm-hmm. But retailers that own a lot of things can fail 
obviously, you know, Sears owned a ton of its real estate and stuff, and it has problems and tons of retailers that at least don't have problems. So, mm-hmm. Okay, it goes through the headquarters. Right, so it gives you some owned and leased things. For like a um, microcap company or something, this would be very interesting, the square footage, where it is, the distribution thing. Like if we were looking at Tandy, they have a huge facility in um, Fort Worth, mm-hmm. which I haven't actually seen from the outside or something, but is allegedly worth like a lot of money. Really? Um, I think it was mentioned in a write-up recently in Value Investors Club that it was assessed for $15 million for tax purposes. We know the market cap. Yeah, the whole 50 million. 50 million. Yeah. Um, I know it's big and that it's been there a while. Um, so that's interesting for like microcaps. It's almost never interesting for very big companies. Their property isn't going to really matter mm-hmm. that much. Do you love this art right here? I feel like you just kind of flipped the page on that. That I flipped this right away. The yeah. That has been declining. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Select so financial data. Just a snapshot, and I like this because it gives you, I guess, more of a full picture over the past, you know, five years. This is very useful, especially when they give information like store operating data. So if we see here, this stuff is all very standard things. Mm-hmm. But then what's interesting is what they put in the store operating data. That's what they chose to put in. They think those are sort of their key performance indicators or whatever you want to call them. Mm-hmm. So a very typical one for retailers is the number of stores comparable store sales, but note that they put in inventory turnover, yeah. which is interesting and doesn't vary by that much. Like we're not seeing variation in inventory turnover Mm-mm. that's at the levels of like a Tandy or something. Mm-hmm. But a turnover is a thing that I think most people underestimate, most investors. I hear investors talk all the time about margins and not about turns. Yeah. And you don't talk about margins unless you're also going to talk about turns. They don't matter. Uh, you can turn inventory less and have higher margins or turn it more and have lower margins easily by, um, I mean, by changing what you're willing to accept in terms of turns, you could have different margins. So I wouldn't just pay attention to margins. What really matters is uh, for returns on capital is the turns uh, combined with the margins. So they obviously care a lot about them. You see them there. Um, The number of stores then is a part that's really interesting to me about a retailer. Because if the retailer is having problems with the same store sales are declining, what do you think I want to see? Wait, what? Okay. Say it one more time. Let's so say, I was reading a different let's line say same there. store sales are declining. Uh-huh. What, uh, do I, what do I want to see in terms of number of stores open each year? Going down? Going down or staying the same. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. What I never want to see is that the same the number of stores opened is higher every single year. You know, the net mm-hmm. number, the total number of store bases is going up, 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 and the comparable sales is going down, down, down. Because mm-hmm. that would be terrible. I was um, reading this this uh, this footnote right here. In fiscal 2018, we yes, recognize goodwill impairment, impairment charge is tolling seven hundred. Does that relate to the mobile? Ninety five million. I don't know. Let's Probably see. Does it say? Yeah, it does, goodwill and tangible assets. Phone, yeah, it didn't say. Thing, yeah, that's mm-hmm. what I would guess because they didn't acquire GameStop. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So it, it, that you can see in the goodwill impairment, they only have goodwill impairment once um, in the last five years. Mm-hmm. And it's a very big number. <laughs> Massive number. That's what caught yeah. my eye. I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. yeah. So that's probably exiting <clears throat> that business. The thing that caught my eye, of course, is the comparable store sales. So just go over that for each year. Do you see that one where year where they have? So it's incredibly unstable. Mm -hmm. That's a huge note. Sometimes it's going up a lot. Uh, it's kind of yeah, it's all over the place in a huge way. So mm-hmm. it's very unpredictable same source sales. So that is a concern. It makes sense if this company is basically the which it is the dominant one in its industry. That what we're seeing is just fluctuations in the industry and the video game physical sales of video games is very unstable. Mm-hmm. Right. But this would be normally for a retail or something. Your comparable store sales are normally going to be much less volatile than that because it's more like how the concept's doing, right? I mean, I don't play Xbox okay. regularly. I don't even own one, but I do know people that do, and they always download the games nowadays, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting because it's not faster than going to a GameStop. No, no. I mean, I could download a game on Xbox or go to the GameStop here. I could probably get the game at the GameStop and get back Black in time Hooker. faster mm-hmm. than No, prob- no you, you definitely could. Yeah, even on, yeah. There's a GameStop everywhere. I mean, what mm-hmm. mall around here doesn't have a GameStop? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're, they're 374 in Texas. <laughs> yeah, and they're <laughs> they're very close to every place you would want. Um, so it is a convenience-based thing that way, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it's giving more of an or- overview, mm-hmm. kind of more of this information, store count information. So this See what part, they open. So this stuff that's different than what you'd expect is what's really interesting. So, for instance, they say growth in the video game industry is generally driven by the introduction of new technology. That whole thing, that mm-hmm. paragraph is very interesting. Um, then they talk about sales of digital content, DLCs, downloadable content, all that stuff. That's very interesting. And um, they also talk about in their discussion of results of operations, which things they talk about. And so that's also useful to mm-hmm. understand. Um then there's some stuff that isn't necessarily as interesting. Um, 
like for instance, the store count information. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, store count information often isn't that useful because it just depends on how they classify it. And so like they say they have 5,796 video game stores. Well, I've been in their stores. That was in 2018. Se- right. Large section of their stores are devoted to collectibles and stuff. Yeah. So it's just a thing of classifying how they choose to do mm-hmm. it. Like when I mentioned Tandy, Tandy reclassified wholesale and retail to just lump them all together. And then for many years they hadn't done that. Um, so that kind of thing is often you think it's really useful until you kind of go to the stores and things and figure out whether it is or isn't. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing there, of course, is the number of stores they got rid of. Right, so mm-hmm. not a lot of successful chains get rid of stores. So if you hadn't figured it out yet, the chain's having some issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, some more snapshots. Yeah. Talk so about the margins. This part is the part I'd be most interested in. Is this table down here? This one. Yeah. Okay. So this is where we're getting a table that's actually giving me the things like sales and gross profit figures, right? Mm-hmm. So the big thing is: is there a big difference between the net sales number and the gross profit number? So net sales is the third column here, or well, this one, the, that sales. That column there, the first column, yeah. and the third column. And um, then gross profit is the number below that. Yep. Now, what we can do, which they may do later, I don't know if they do in this um, report, is break down the percentages ourselves. So what they're going to do is percent of net sales, and then they're going to do gross profit percentage, right? That's what they do. Yeah. Yep. So they actually do this for us, which I would do manually myself anyway, which is that they tell us how much each contributes. So this is very similar to a car dealer, right? So at first we think, oh, new video game hardware, so a new Xbox or something, is a very important part of the business. It's 21%. It's one of the three biggest things that they have. Actually, it's meaningless. It only brings in 8% of the gross profit, right? Mm -hmm. So that's similar to like car dealers, where you think, oh, new car sales, that's really big and important and everything. It's a lot of sales. It's not a lot of gross profit, whereas like the repair and the warranty and all that stuff is big. So what does matter more? Well, we can see the new stuff doesn't matter as much, What matters a lot is the pre-owned, right? Mm -hmm. So huge number for pre-owned is um, down there, right? Mm -hmm. 43%. Okay. It's 43% in terms of the margin. And then also it's what, 810. So this is the part that I would do. So uh, 810.4 out of 2.3 means that you're talking about like a third. You're talking about over a third. So over a third of the gross profit, which is the actual amount that matters, to the company, that's the actual contribution, it doesn't matter what the sales number is, is being contributed by uh, pre-owned stuff. Mm -hmm. So used games are an important part of it and used other products and stuff, right? And then we see the other things that matter. So used games, new games, accessories, those are all the things that matter the most to them. Collectibles matter a little bit too. New hardware doesn't matter a lot, but of course it could be driving sales. Because someone might buy new hardware and at the same time then buy a lot of games or shortly thereafter, that's the reason for being in the store in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Black Friday or something, maybe GameStop has the lowest price on a, a, the new Xbox or PlayStation or whatever some years. So um, it, that's a very important section. This would be probably the area I would focus the most on of anything we've seen in the 10K so far. Interesting. Okay, let me delete this. Still figuring out how to use that. Okay, perfect. So scroll down. Look compare 2018 to 2017. Mm-hmm. So this gives you the change thing, which is the always right in percentage terms, which is always sort of the headline thing. Like mm-hmm. any news report or something is going to just obsess about this area. Um, I would look, so what's the change in net sales? Was down what? Um, net sales, uh, 3%. Right. But then the change in gross profit was down even more. 7%. Yeah. The other thing I would focus on is the selling general administrative expenses. They were down slightly, right? Mm-hmm. Am I right about that? 1%? Yeah. 1%. So that's good that that happened. I mean, that's not nearly enough but yeah it's always an achievement when a company reduces sgna at all so it's kind of interesting and it means they're probably aware of um the challenges that Issues. they have yeah. yeah they're not trying to we've seen that in a bunch of places they're not trying to grow all the time and stuff they're obviously trying to turn around the business mm-hmm. yeah. okay let's see so then they'll talk about the sales yep it's always good to know figures. the way they break it all down mm-hmm This is the discussion of the goodwill impairment. So the goodwill impairment is not that interesting as like a non-cash charge, but what it can be interesting as is giving us an idea of um, what it came from, whether it was a bad acquisition or something Mm -hmm. like that. And here they talk about... They don't even break it down and say what's from. They probably will later on, but... There is a discussion there that says simply Mac. Oh, there you go. um, But that's just for... For 11 million. million, So I assume it's for this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then they'll compare 2017 to 2016. Yeah, they compare the previous year before that, too, obviously. Okay, segment, segment performance. Yeah. Though. Okay, so segment performance is sometimes interesting, but I here, think it's pretty interesting. This is a breakdown in terms of geography, so mm-hmm. we'll see if it's that useful. So um, they give us the store count, they give us the comparable store sales, so the same store sales number, and then they also give us the um, operating loss that they have, right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, 
you had across the board operating losses yep. for those things in that year. Of course, for the year before, you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also had the comparable store sale, this comp same store sale stuff for each of them. Um, I don't know if they're hugely different. This is the problem is that how volatile the results are, right? So if you look, going back a few years, you have huge declines in the U.S., but then you go forward a few years, you have huge declines in Europe. Mm -hmm. They seem like it's just very volatile, so I'm having trouble figuring out exactly that the same store sales is as meaningful here as it is with a lot of retailers. Um, but normally you'd be looking at a lot of same store sales, and you'd also be looking to see if they have really high profits in one area and not in another. Now, here you add back the goodwill impairment to really figure it out. So actually, they made a bunch of money in the U.S., mm -hmm. right? So without the goodwill impairment, they made 200 some million dollars in the U.S. Yeah. Um, what's the market cap on the stock? Let's see. Yeah. So the U.S. alone easily mm -hmm. uh, would... Pretty much cover it. Almost. Oh, well, yeah, but I mean, if you value it at like one, years of e one year of EBIT. Yeah. So the U.S., I mean, basically what that tells me is if I understand the U.S. better than the other areas of the business or something the, my concern would be of course they lose money in these other areas mm -hmm. but don't even worry too much about thinking about them because there's so much earnings coming off of the US that it could easily justify the current stock price because the stock price is so cheap yeah. so like I don't have to think too much about Canada, Australia or Europe or any of those sorts of things now obviously you then have the um, corporate overhead and all that mm -hmm. stuff. but I just mean uh, it, that gives you a hint and it's a good idea to kind of simplify and say like what are the biggest segments here and the biggest segments here are the U.S. by far, and then Europe, and then the other ones are just small and wouldn't, you know, be things that you'd look at individually. Got it. So they're comparing more. Yeah. So then they talk about sources of liquidity, share repurchase program. Um, I would say the share repurchase program is kind of interesting. So what stands out to you about the share repurchase program? Um, let's see. Which had 107, because that was from the past. Total number of shares, 3 million shares. The average price per share would be that where they probably repurchase that, okay, right? So, so 24.94. It is a lot lower. <laughs> so $3.84 for people listening on the podcast. Right. And so it, bulk of where they repurchase. Like 85% yeah. where they did repurchases. Yeah. So it's interesting. I, I mean, it's interesting that they bought back. So that they thought it was cheap then, right? <laughs> that they thought it was cheap then, or why did they do that yeah. buyback or something like that? It's also interesting that they paid a lot of dividends and did a lot of buybacks. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, it tells you they have a lot of cash that way. But that's that's very interesting. I don't know if it means they badly misjudged the situation, which could be a concern that management does, and the board doesn't understand what the situation is, mm -hmm. or that the stock's incredibly cheap, but it's another sign. Usually you don't have buybacks done at five times yeah, or it's crazy. more um, the uh, price that it's at now. Yeah. Okay. Contractual obligations, talk about their operating uh, leases and then some notes that they have outstanding as well. Yes. 2.4 billion yeah. in total payments due. So this is the area that I would treat as what their debt, debt is. To be yeah. honest, I would treat the leases as debt because they're as much debt as anything else. Now they don't, they can get out of them pretty quickly. They don't have to keep them for that long. Um, but they have to cover them. And this is their biggest issue in terms of the risks of the company, in terms of your risks as a shareholder, is their difficulty in meeting their mm -hmm. rent requirements. What do you usually look for in this line right here? I think it's always good to read that off balance sheet arrangements. Yes, sure. I would hope that they don't have it. Yeah, nothing right? <laughs> uh, for a retailer like this. Like if it's an investment bank or something, they may have off balance sheet yeah. arrangements that are fine. But here, yeah, I would hope that they don't have it. Okay. So then it talks about the critical accounting um, assumption uh, um, policies and use of estimates. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so so far these are boring and they're normally what I would expect. I would read them, but they're very st so far what I'm seeing is very standard gap things mm -hmm. of what you would say of how copy and paste their, their inventory and stuff. Yeah, there, there's a lot of it here though. Mm -hmm. um, Recognized goodwill and payment charges totaling 795.6 million. Let's see for mm -hmm. the United States, Canada, Australia, and Europe segments. Do yeah, this break is it down? Section. It's very hard for people to read and understand. It. They do like a DCF type approach to figure out the cash flows that they project on the goodwill. It's, it's how they do it under gap, and it's not yeah, it's something that we need to worry about. It's income taxes, we know that the U.S. government changed their corporate tax rate. We don't have to worry about that. Foreign currency risk, I'd just be interested in whether they hedge or not. Mm -hmm. um, they say that, that we do not use it for trading or speculative purposes, um, and so that means that whatever they do have is a, is a hedge. Um, or they believe it's a hedge. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, then here you have the uh, internal control stuff, which for a company like GameStop usually is going to say that they have sufficient internal controls, but actually they say, what did they say? Um, no, they did not say that. Uh, yes. Probably they somewhere said, they do. No, they still haven't said it. Yes, they did. They have material weaknesses there. Yeah. 
so that paragraph that you were highlighting does discuss the material weaknesses. I don't care as much about the internal control weaknesses as most people seem to. Um, it's not, I mean, it would be interesting for to them. see what it's in, but I'd, I mean, for I thought GameStop wouldn't have them. It's a pretty big company. But for smaller companies, it's common all the time to have um, internal control deficiencies or to just have the auditor say that they didn't review mm-hmm. internal controls. Um, and then there's a discussion of material weakness there. So mm-hmm. that I said that there would be one, and there was. So if they do identify material weakness, you're going to see a section like that that's literally listed that way. You can see um, where their auditor is. Yes. So I like to see their auditor, and I like to see where their auditor is. So um, Deloitte is a very big auditor, one of the uh, you know half dozen biggest in, in yeah. the U.S., and audits tons of public companies. And then I like to see that it's Dallas, Texas. So they picked an office of the auditor that's nearby uh, the company, which for very small companies and things matters more. Sometimes they pick someone from a completely different state that's an auditor I've never heard of. That's more of a concern. This mm-hmm. is normal and we like to go on the PCAOB website to exactly. read about that auditor and mm-hmm. the reports and stuff like that. Yep. Okay, getting down to the financials. Okay, let's see. Uh, they also mentioned how long they started the auditor. That's a thing that you can now see all the time in 10Ks. So they've been the auditor since 2013. That's fine. So it just shows that they've been switching auditors all the time. All right, the balance sheet. Yes. First thing that stands out to you. Where do your eyes automatically go? Oh, in this case, it, inventory. Okay. Because okay, inventory is a very big number for them, I would say. Um, and then the other thing that it would go to is assets held for sale, which meant they were selling something last year, which, again, is probably related to that acquisition that didn't do well. Yeah. Um, uh, then the other thing that I'd be looking at is the debt type mm-hmm. things. Those are really the only areas. We know from the so we've seen of earnings and stuff that they probably produce – um, quite a lot of cash as long as they don't suck it up with inventory and stuff. And then we just have to look at the liability side of it. Um, an interesting thing here that stands out really dramatically is what's the market cap in this company? We said 300 something yep, million. Yep. Retained earnings. So they had retained over, now they had retained over 2 billion before the write down. And now they're down to 1.3 billion. Um, this is a weird thing to say, but. It is interesting when a company's market cap is significantly below the retained earnings because of how retained earnings work. So it means that they had to have put the money back into the business. They actually earned the money and then put it back into the business in a way that didn't create value for the stock to be right about it. So normally, Because you you're not have, seeing it reflected in the market cap? Right. So normally if the retained earnings of a company vastly exceeds the market cap, that's immediately interesting and potentially could mean that its assets are very undervalued, could mean that if there's any strategic value in this business that other people in the industry want to buy them up and stuff. Now, we know that GameStop is like the biggest in this industry, so this isn't true. This is maybe people are concerned it's a declining industry and stuff. That's why the market cap's so low. But obviously, at one time, this business was incredibly valuable to yeah. today. We know that from other things that we've seen in the market cap. But anytime you see retained earnings higher than market cap is interesting. And if you see it like four times higher, that's shocking and would immediately put this in the value um, type camp. And, and I just think it's interesting because I feel like almost no one ever mentions retained earnings. Mm-hmm. So I just think it's worth looking at. Okay, go down to the income statement. Um, yeah, so you have big impairment things here. The thing that would matter is like, you know, excluding that from the impairments. Um, it is interesting that despite all the talk about buybacks and stuff, I'm not seeing much of a decline in the weighted average shares outstanding. So obviously that's the thing that I care most about. I don't mm-hmm. really look at buybacks so much as whether the share count's going up or down. Um, that's just going to give you foreign currency adjustments. It's the only thing that matters here because I don't think they have um, pension. What do you look for in the consolidated thing. statements of stockholders' equity? Because this is basically a useless statement if you've read all the other statements. So I find it to be useless. <laughs> um, but you could look at it and see that they have certain items here, that mm-hmm. they have repurchased stock, that they have um, stock-based compensation, and that they have foreign currency stuff. That's the only stuff that shows up here, and it already showed up in the comprehensive statement. So I feel like if you've read the comprehensive income statement and you've um, – also read the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. I just think that there's nothing in here that's of note and all of it's explained better in footnotes. So I would say if you're not going to read any statement, definitely skip the stock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cash flow statement. We just did a podcast on cash flow statements. Yeah. So if we just start with the obvious one is just to start with the net cash flow from operations. Yeah. I would just add those all up. Look at the difference too, right? So you could tell like some funky stuff has been going on in mm-hmm. the income statement just yeah. from the change from that income to cash flow from right. operating activities. So I would just eyeball it and add it up. So we have what, like in the last three years, you had 500 something, 400 something, and 300 something million 
in cash flow from operations, meaning that you've averaged about four hundred million a year in the cash flow from operations. And then we look at purchase of property, plant, and equipment. That's something that I don't see a lot of people talk about. You always average like the last three years. I don't. Yeah, I don't, don't see a lot of people use do a that. Cash flow statement for a single year because of the volatility and things like working capital. So I would never use it. Always use a three-year average. Mm-hmm. Um, and then purchase of property, plant, and equipment. You then also use a three-year average of that. It's a hundred some million. So I take four hundred million, subtract the hundred some million. You get like three hundred million. Which in like the market cap. Likely free cash flow, which is like the market cap. So again. It's shocking, and it means the stock is incredibly cheap compared to its cash flow generating abilities right now. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying go out and buy GameStop, yeah, but yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah, you never see a stock this cheap, so it's interesting. From a bird's eye view. Okay, go through. Well, if it doesn't deteriorate, a, well, that's what I'm by saying. Huge amounts, yeah. then yeah, it's obviously. That's what it cheap. is today. It doesn't know what we don't know right. what's going to be. We don't. We're not too familiar with the investment case, right? right. Two, three, four, five years out be hard to predict, I would say. Okay. So then we go into the footnotes. Yeah. After the, uh, if you ever see, you know, what's interesting too, when people ask about accounting and stuff, I Mm -hmm. think this is why we always say just read 10 K's right. Mm -hmm. Instead of books. I mean, cause they just go, you just learn what all the line items mean, right? right? They go into it. Yeah. So a few things are interesting. So, um, one that was, that does stand out. It's not a big deal is that they do have restricted cash. Uh, lots of companies have restricted cash, but why they're doing that. Sometimes that gives you hints about how they're financing certain things. This has to do with their foreign subsidiaries. They mentioned, I would just read that, um, cash and cash equivalents. You can read. This is a very typical one from what I can see. I like it when for smaller companies and stuff, they sometimes tell me more what they're in. This one I think says that they're in us treasury obligations, money market investment yeah. funds holding. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, um, but sometimes I've read ones from microcaps that literally tell you what, um, bank they're in and whether they're over the FDIC limits and things like that. It, it can help understanding things about how likely it is something's a fraud and stuff like that if they give you a lot of detail about the cash. Um, They're still not saying what that that uh, impairment was. I'm, it's somewhere in here, but... Yeah, there's a section on it. I think if it's the Spring Mobile thing or whatever it was mm-hmm. called, there's a section early on about that business. Um, if it's a discontinued operation, they're not going to talk about it much. Mm-hmm. It does talk about how they account for it. So revenue recognition. So revenue recognition is a very big area usually. Here I don't know that it matters that much, but for like more of a growth company or company that would have more discretion how they're recognizing revenue, it would be very important. Like right here, revenue is recognized, net of sale discounts, and net of estimate sales return reserves. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, that means it's pretty conservative, mm-hmm. probably. Um, then the loyalty program is very interesting. Um, and that's complicated. So the accounting for the loyalty program is going to be very complicated. So they talk about a power up rewards loyalty program allows members and then all that. That's almost like gift cards and stuff. It's pretty complicated. I kind of want to read about the accounting, not so much to understand how they actually accounted for it, but just because I want to learn about the loyalty program, Mm -hmm. like whether it's really creating loyalty. What do you, before you go into that, what do you think about the way that it says we recognize revenue when performance obligations are satisfied by transferring goods or services to the customer in an amount that we expect to collect in exchange for those goods or services. Yeah, I think that's generically what yeah. uh, revenue recognition is. Yeah. Okay. So you you would le- read about the loyalty program? Yeah. Um, so some of the others. I mean, they have a thing about vendor arrangements. Um, I don't think it would be interesting to read that and see if there's anything unique about it. Um, they talk about cooperative advertising. That's the only thing that's kind of really interesting about it. If you've been to the stores, you can see a lot of tons of cooperative advertising. So it, that's GameStop stores were kind of like a movie theater in terms of how much advertising there is in them. So it's kind of similar. The obviously publishers need to use a lot of advertising in store. Um, leases would be very important, but we've seen that talked about a lot in different places. Foreign currency, I just kind of ignore because I don't care that much about their operations. Just the U.S. part is so cheap versus that I focus on the U.S. because I'm not going to understand other countries as well in this case. Um, and then we have, let's see. Um, okay, and then you have recent accounting pronouncements. This is a place where if people want to know what sections you could skip or what you're likely to be confused by and stuff. Yeah. Um, I read them, but recent accounting pronouncements is probably the area that's going to most confuse people because it's going to be a lot of discussions of things that might not matter that much to this company. There you go. So there you go. Spring Mobile, yeah. So it talks about the sale, the impairments, all that sort of stuff, and it gives a, the assets to yeah, it and what everything. Was it, where they assign each of the things to. Then they have another d- disposition uh, and cricket. So they've acquired and disposed of a couple different things in areas that are outside of sort of their core. So that just gives you hints about, you know, the company strategy mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, Break it out revenue again. Yeah. Performance this, obligations. Yeah. So 
So there's a section here that's about warranties. That's really the only thing it, down. It's like the second to last paragraph or so. That's in terms of it giving me some ideas of how long the warranties are, what they could cost, things like that. I don't think it's usually that big a, bit, a deal. Um, usually I think companies like this, just like car dealers and stuff, have a pretty good handle on what the warranties are and cost and stuff. So it's not something I'd necessarily worry about. Um, and then we've got a huge section of the asset impairment. And then um, let's see then we get to areas that is more typical and useful, mm -hmm. right? So receivables. So we have information about the receivables that they have. So some of it's interesting that we see that the vendor receivables is actually not all of their total receivables, which is kind of interesting. So their actual receivables they have is less than I thought. Um, and that just is the bank card receivable stuff. So I probably would have overstated how much of their uh, receivables they're collecting faster than I thought, basically. Um, and then we have, you can just skip the intangible asset stuff. This is not very interesting. Um, income tax is probably okay to skip because you can guess that on your own. Um, they give a breakdown. This, If you want to focus on income taxes, this is the only area that really matters. Is this one where it talks about the federal statutory rate? And then it talks about the um, amounts that are different from them. And so if there was things that were typical of the business... Um, like say they were getting a depletion allowance or something mm -hmm. like that, then it would show up here or an R and D thing that's happening all the time. It would show up here. Nothing I'm seeing here really suggests to me that they pay an unusual tax rate. They may have unusual tax rates because of the tax reform or because they had a big write down or because of whatever. Mm -hmm. But I just think in a normal year, GameStop pays a normal tax rate based on that table I just saw. So, um, you can skip that because that's not of any interest to people. You can skip that one too. The debt part is interesting. Just breaking this it down more. You right. read in detail about it. That's, you know, what the rates are and things yeah, like that. Those aren't very expensive um, rates, but, you know, we'll see long term what, if it's more expensive to have them in the future. There's a huge section on the revolving credit facility. The part that's more interesting usually is the um, the, the notes. So this the senior notes that we saw and then the credit facility. The credit facility tends to be more typical that you see all the time. The leases are very much what I'd be interested in here. And then, um, but they talked about it a bunch already. And then, you know, you also have legal proceedings to see if that's interesting. They're not talking about things that are particularly interesting to me. Um, yeah, it's talking about French subsidiaries tax issue and stuff like that. So it sounds like a one-time mm -hmm. type thing. Going um, through the repurchase again. Yeah. Of their own shares. Yep. And then uh, if we keep going, let's see, we can get to, you know, a lot of this is not, all that interesting. Um, there is discussion of the employee defined contribution plan, but I don't think that's going to be very interesting here. Segment, segment information, information is what it, we care a lot about, and we see some of that. The useful things here is it actually breaks down the assets and the capex and the total segment. Yeah, assets. so you can so get like free cash flow. We can get free cash flow yeah. for every section. And that would be really interesting. So here we go. Operating earnings were three hundred ninety-eight million in the U.S. For instance, in twenty seventeen, we can use twenty nineteen. You want to do twenty nineteen right here? Sure. So the, an operating loss, but then the impairment has to add back. So I was going to skip that one, but we'll do that. <laughs> one. So, so that's two hundred and sixty million, let's say, in uh, in um, earnings before. Uh, the impairment. Yeah, and then you could add back. And you know. also add back the asset impairment. So that's 12 million. Again, that's seven. So that's 80 million added to 260 million. That's about 340 million. CapEx was only about 51 million. So we're having a very high amount of free cash flow. It's, it's rivaling the market cap just from the US. Um, now, obviously, they have corporate overhead and stuff that sucks that up. But it just tells you that if the other things are just worth, you know, basically break even Canada, Australia, and Europe, then the US alone would be able to justify the market cap with no problem. Mm -hmm. They also give you things that I would use to calculate things. So they do property and equipment net. You can see it has a tremendously high returns on capital and mm -hmm. stuff, but we'd expect that because they lease everything. Sure. They only really tie up things in inventory, stuff like that. We care a lot about this segment. I always come yeah. to this to get like if especially if they have different like sections of the business yes. to really break it down yeah we spend some of the most time of anything in that section yeah okay going through some capex stuff and then you have the end of it which is the exhibit and you have all the exhibits which you usually don't need to know any of those things because if you needed them you would be able to see them in the previous page on Edgar, just so people know. Mm -hmm. So on the page that has all the exhibits. Um, I don't think there was anything interesting in terms of the exhibits. If you go back one page, or are you just on your browser? Are you? Is that how you found it was in Edgar yeah. that way? Okay, so let's see. Right. So you would have looked here before, I would have looked here before reading anything. And if there were interesting exhibits, the typical ones that would be interesting would be exhibit 13, which there's none of here, and exhibit 99. And what's 13? 13 will probably be like an annual report, something they sent to their 
their um, shareholders that has financial statements that they've chosen to put as like an exhibit here instead of including directly in the 10K. Mm -hmm. And then 99 is going to have all sorts of weird stuff that otherwise most companies aren't reporting. Sure. So like, uh, but it's usually very interesting stuff. So like 99.1 or something for um, NACO is the breakdown of their subsidiaries, um, of their unconsolidated subsidiaries. So very interesting audited results of each of their um, uh, unconsolidated subsidiaries, like a tremendous amount of detail about the company that actually isn't included in the 10K because it's not consolidated. So if there's anything really interesting, you're probably going to see it in Exhibit 13 or 99, and those are the ones that I would look for. Then the other stuff is going to be very boring things like this. You're <laughs> going to see the certification every single time. There's going to be the audit. Um, the list of subsidiaries is always there. Everything here is just completely typical. So from what we just looked at, what stood out to you and where would you want to, I guess, do more research on? Is it, is it, I mean, it generates a ton of free cash flow. Yeah. Right. What else? What stood out to me is leases and the sources of gross profit and the segment that I don't have to worry that much about segments other than the U S mm -hmm. because it just would be harder for me to research like Europe or something. Um, so it's telling me that it's cheap enough based on the U S alone and it, is the risk is the leases and then what i have to understand really well is their sources of gross profit like can they get a lot of gross profit from used games for instance and that's a big concern like i they could be selling stuff in a GameStop, or there could be a market for video games but what if the physical market for used games really declines a mm -hmm. lot? that would be something that i could easily misjudge and so my misjudgment risk is really tied to things like the physical like used games sales mm -hmm. that would be a big concern because you could think about like with textbooks in colleges and things yeah where there was a big market for used textbooks and things but of course then if they're doing things digital things to compete with that then that affects that market and all that so the digital like how that plays in with used games because you saw how big a part used games are of this business mm -hmm. yeah cool any other thoughts on the company no. Can you see why a lot of value investors are interested in it? It's very, very cheap. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely. I can see that as well. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself. 45 minutes. I mean, we're probably going to do these long form um, podcasts, more like one off. But if you enjoyed it, leave us a, uh, a comment on the YouTube. Like I said, we're trying to hack the YouTube algorithm. Leave us a, a comment and thumbs it up. Also, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, hopefully, you know, you still were able to follow along. We tried to talk mm -hmm. out loud, uh, but definitely look at it on YouTube. Uh, 45 minutes of video of us just going through the 10k i want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with jeff and myself we will see you in the next podcast take care hey this is andrew coon and that was the focus compounding podcast the podcast where jeff and i talk about actionable stock ideas investing concepts and the overall way that we think about investing at focus compounding capital management go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from jeff every other week and be sure to check out all of our other work where jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along.